How the New York Mets missed opportunities to improve this offseason? I'll break it all down on today's edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you uh, amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right on new customers, get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Is a fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Throughout this offseason, I think a narrative has started to form about the Mets and how they maybe haven't been pushing all the chips forward, that they haven't been trying to win this season, and that they've maybe dropped the ball. I mean, I've actually seen Mets fans who have already turned on David Stearns before they've watched the Mets play a single baseball game under his leadership. So what I wanted to do today, sort of building off yesterday's show where I talked about how David Stearns was able to build playoff contenders with less in Milwaukee than what he even has now. And I wanted to go through the entire marketplace and and try to find missed opportunities where the Mets should have done more. And there are some here, but I think overall what you're going to find is the the action or inaction by the Mets this offseason is as much to do with what the marketplace is in free agency as anything else. It is a weird year. Now, we open up with starting pitchers, and particularly starting pitchers who got long-term deals. Shohei Otani, call him a starting pitcher. Um, he counts, but regardless, he didn't even pick up the phone to, to call the Mets to show any interest in playing for them. So the Mets are absolved. Yoshinobu Yamamoto. We talked about Yamamoto enough this offseason. The Mets did everything they could. He wanted to be a Dodger. It's a missed opportunity, sure, but I think they would have had a significantly overpay to get him. And it would have been embarrassing if you threw a $375 million offer in front of him and he still chose the Dodgers. They gave him a fair deal. The Dodgers matched it. We move on. Aaron Nola signs to come back to the Phillies. Never going to happen with the Mets. Sonny Gray, three years, $75 million to go to the Cardinals. Would have loved Sonny Gray in a Mets uniform. Don't know if he wanted to come back to New York. And in his introductory press conference, he talked about how he's always wanted to be a Cardinal. So again, you're, you know, fighting a losing battle if you think the Mets could have got him. Seth Lugo and Marcus Stroman, two guys that I just don't think would have wanted to come back to New York. For Lugo, it's because they never really gave him a full faith effort to be in the starting rotation. You know, early in his career, he was there. They moved him to the bullpen. He thrived. 2020, they threw him into the mix at the end of the season. It was a short year. Just, you know, never really gave him that chance. I don't think he wanted to come back as a starting pitcher from the Mets. And he probably didn't trust that he would stay in the rotation. With the Mets, so he signs with the Royals. Marcus Stroman, I think on both sides that bridge was burned, right? So now we move to the first real missed opportunity in my eyes. That's Aurora Rodriguez. He signed a four-year, eighty million dollar deal with the Arizona Diamondbacks. It's a great contract in my eyes. I don't think that that's an overpay. You know, twenty million dollars for Erod in this market. That's fine. He got more years than anybody but Yamamoto and Nola. When you're talking about strictly pitchers, um, but. You know, young enough, I, I think if the Mets could have signed them, he would have looked great in that number two spot behind Kodai Senga. But here's where the Mets were fighting a little bit of a losing battle on Erod with who he ultimately signed with. For one, he signs with a team that was just in the World Series. Two, he had a relationship with their manager, Tori Lovello, and their GM, Mike Hazen, dating back to the time with the Red Sox. So the two sides were comfortable with each other. He was sort of the final piece that they needed as far as building out that team this offseason. It made too much sense for him. So, again, even though the Mets could have pushed a little bit harder, if they did, and let's say they gave him a $90 million offer, all of a sudden that contract starts to get a little bit bad, honestly, if you think about the breakdown and what you're committed to, because the guy has been good and was great last year, but also the year prior he wasn't good. So I don't think the Mets really made a big mistake there, although that is a guy that you look back on and say, yeah, Maybe would have been nice if they signed him. Shota Imanaga, four years, $53 million deal with the Cubs, but that contract is pretty intricate. 
you know, it's the first two years that are sort of set in stone where he's making, I think, nine and 13 with a $1 million signing bonus. So it's like a two year, $23 million deal. Then it gets that $53 million number because there's a couple of player options. Um, but there's also a club option that's for three years, $57 million, that turns that into a five year, uh, $80 million deal. Regardless of the contract structure, I always thought the Mets should have been in on Imanaga, but you also don't know if Imanaga was interested in the Mets. And it seems like he really wanted to be a Cub based on everything that we've learned since. And also on top of that, there's always been that notion, right, about you know, two Japanese players on one team. Yoshinobu Yamamoto said it wasn't a problem. He went to go play with Otani. I get that. But Imanaga might have been a little more old school. He is older, and he might not have wanted to share a spotlight with Kodai Sango, so he gets to go to the Cubs and sort of have more of that spotlight on him as far as, you know, at least the Japanese market. So, again, as much as I love that contract, and I think it would have been perfect for the Mets, I can kind of let them off the hook there. All right, now we get to the two-year deals. Lucas Giolito, the Mets were in the mix for Giolito. He ends up getting $38.5 million from the Red Sox. Michael Walker, two years, 32 million. Never really saw the Mets linked to him. There is some injury concern there. Absolutely. I do think he's a better pitcher than Sean Mania, but I also think he's more of a risk on a two-year deal than Sean Mania. And for the Mets, they got him $4 million cheaper, two years, 28 million. And there's probably more upside. I think Walker is what he is, which is a good pitcher, but Mania's second half does lead you to think there could be more in the tank. Giolito's second half was awful. And when you just look at it that way and say, all right, you either have Mania on this two-year contract or Giolito, and there's a, I think there's a 30-year option to it too, at $38.5 million, which is $10.5 million more, the more I like Mania when you really compare the two. So as much as at the time we thought ah, Giolito would have been a nice fit, I think Mania is not that far off from what they would have got with Giolito. The other two-year guys, Kenta Maeda. Two years, $24 million with the Tigers. Manai is a better pitcher than Maeda at this stage of their careers. Tyler Malley with the Rangers, two years, $22 million. He's coming off Tommy John, won't pitch until the second half. So I think the Mets did it right there. Eric Fetty, they were in the mix for Fetty, but he ended up getting two years, $15 million with the White Sox. And if you were to tell me who's going to be better this year, Eric Fetty or Adrian Hauser, I really don't know where I would pick. I would say Fetty maybe has more upside based on what he did in the KBO, but that was also in the KBO. And if Eric Fetty goes back to what he was with the Nationals, that second year at $7.5 million would have hurt you a little bit. It's a guy that I think the Mets could have signed, but with where they're at, I don't think that Eric Fetty is changing the fortunes of the Mets season. I really don't. Guys left on the market, Jordan Montgomery, Blake Snell, Mike Clevenger. Um, also, he and Jin Ryu, the Mets showed some interest in. For Clevenger and Ryu, I think Manaya is right in line with those guys. For Montgomery and Snell, is it a missed opportunity to not sign them? Potentially, but based on what's sort of rumored out there for these guys, you know, ace money for Montgomery when he's still probably, for the length of a potential six, seven year deal, more of a three than a one. Blake Snell potentially, you know, wanting eight nine years at $30 million per. I don't necessarily think it's a missed opportunity. The Mets don't sign either of those guys. It'd be great if they did, but when you consider the comp picks attached to Snell, the years that Montgomery might want coming off just an incredible contract year, particularly in that second half with the World Series run, I'm not mad at it either. So then we get to the one missed opportunity that I really believe would be a massive swing and a miss for the Mets. They got to sign Brandon Woodruff. David Cerns has to play on that relationship and get a deal done. Two-year deal for Brandon Woodruff that allows you to have him join your rotation in 2025 on a relatively team-friendly deal. Get that one done. Get that one done. I think it'd be a missed opportunity the Mets didn't do it. But overall, when you look at the market, there wasn't a frontline starter outside of Yamamoto, Montgomery, and Snell that you really could have gotten. And I think Manaya on the contract that they signed him to was as good of an option as guys like Giolito um, and Waka at a better price point. I'm really not mad at what the Mets did overall. Would have been great to see Erod or Imanaga in that rotation. But when you see where these guys land, 
you get a clearer picture of what the Mets were up against. And I think they did well based on all of those circumstances. Even if the rotation doesn't look amazing on paper, they at least have depth and guys that can give them innings. And if they can cobble together a good bullpen, they might have enough pitching. But there's also the one-year flyers. And they're banking on Luis Severino. So my question that I'll be trying to answer in the next segment is, for one, did they take the right gamble on that one-year flyer? And then two, should they have bet on some of these relief pitchers that are trying to make that transition to be starters? So we'll go through those two things in the next segment. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by Ibarra. After the holidays, we could all use a little extra cash in our pocket. Make sure you're getting cash back on all of your everyday purchases with Ibotta. Ibotta is a free app that gives you the most cash back every time you shop on hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies and more. The average Ibotta user earns $145 per year. That could cover the entire cost of your trip to the grocery store. Other apps will give you points that don't amount to much with Ibotta. You get that cold, hard cash. All you got to do is add your offers into the app, upload your receipt, and you get that real cash that you can cash out to your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. You can join over 50 million savers and earn cash back every time you shop from over 2,700 brands and retailers, which include Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy, and more. And right now, Abada is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Abada by using the code LOCKDOWNMLB when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store, download the free Abada app to start earning cash back, and use the code LOCKDOWNMLB. That's Ibotta, I-B-O-T-T-A, in the Google Player App Store, and use the code LOCKDOWNMLB. Today's episode is also brought to you by Jace Medical. In life, we want to be prepared for the unexpected, and Jace Medical is there to help. Whether you're on extended travel, if you're bracing for a major weather event, or if you're limited by yet another supply shortage, you are covered when you use Jace Medical. Thanks to our partners, they offer life-saving antibiotics and a long list of daily medications that can be ordered in a one-year supply. It even includes ED generics like Cialis or Viagra. Jace Medical has the Jace case, which provides you with five different antibiotics that treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, amongst others. This stuff could happen to any of us. Make sure you're prepared. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It'll be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medication will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. Did the New York Mets make the right one year gamble on Luis Severino? Let's look at their other options based on who signed so far. Frankie Montas had a one year, $16 million deal that he signed with the Cincinnati Reds. That took place later in the offseason. You could say Montas is a better option. Um, based on recent track record, but he's also coming off an injury. And Severino has more in the tank when it comes to velocity and just pure stuff, in my opinion. $3 million cheaper, more experience in New York. I think between those two guys, the Mets were right with Severino. Now, Jack Flaherty got a one-year $14 million deal. Flaherty is probably a better bet to give you 140 innings, but he also can get knocked around a lot. I think he chose the exact right place for him. That's why he ended up in Detroit. He's going to pitch in a bad division with big ballparks, try to make more the following year. I don't think it was an option for the Mets, and I don't even think it's a better option than Severino. Kyle Gibson, one year, $13 million, and Lance Lynn, one year, $11 million. You can make an argument that both of those guys are a safer bet with a higher floor than Severino, but they also both signed ridiculously early this offseason to the Cardinals, who sort of jumped the market on those two guys. So I don't even know if that ever was on the table for the Mets. Here's my first missed opportunity. Uh, there's two guys. It's really the first one that I think was a missed opportunity, but they signed for similar dollar amounts. You got Wade Miley, eight and a half mil, Martin Perez, eight million. For Perez, you know, he had an all-star season in 2022, 289 ERA, over 196 in the third innings pitched. But last year he had a 4.45 ERA. That's basically right in line with his career 4.44 ERA. I don't think that that was really a swing in the miss by the, by the Mets. I really don't. Miley, though, I would have loved him. Okay, last year he had a 3-1-4 ERA. A really good left-handed pitcher. Has some familiarity with David Stearns. But he also ended up right back where he was at last year in Milwaukee. So a guy that probably just wanted to stay where he has had some of his best years. 
And also, there is sort of an every other year thing with him when it comes to injuries that maybe the Mets want to stay away from. Beyond that, you have a handful of guys that signed for $2 million or less, so we won't even get into them. Overall, when you look at the one-year gambles, I think Severino has the most upside. So considering where the Mets are right now and how this season is sort of a uh, hodgepodge of talent and you just see if it all comes together in the right way, I feel like they made the right decision on Severino. And you know, going back to the last segment, Manaya, Severino, Hauser, when you really think about this market and what has you know been done by other teams, they added a good amount of pitching. Is it frontline starters? Absolutely not. Is there a ton of pressure on Kodai Sanga and Jose Quintana to be what they were last year? For Quintana, that means being what you were, but over a larger sample, to be what he was even when he got the contract from the Mets from 2022. Yes, there's a lot of pressure on those guys. There's a lot of pressure on Severino and Mania to hit that ceiling. But I think the Mets trust their depth between McGill, Lucchese, Budo, then all those guys in the upper levels of the minor leagues with Christian Scott, Mike Vassell, Dominic Hamill, that I think they are going into the season feeling good about their starting pitching depth and good about being able to cobble things together. You look at past David Stern's team with the Brewers, there's a lot of guys who sort of got piggybacked, right? You, you might have four innings of Hauser, three innings of Tyler or McGill. You could see some creative structuring to how these games are played. I think the Mets pitching is going to be a little bit better than we thought. But to have actually been able to execute that type of a plan, I do think there was some missed opportunities in this market of guys who are trying to become starting pitchers who have nasty stuff. And there's three names, Jordan Hicks, Ronaldo Lopez, and Yariel Rodriguez, who just signed today. Rodriguez signed with the Blue Jays, four years, $32 million. He's a Cuban pitcher who ended up in the MPB for a couple of years where he thrived, had a 1-1-5 ERA coming out of the bullpen in 2022, wanted to come stateside last year, got into a dispute with his MPB team, had to wait out a year, but got what he wanted. Became a free agent. It didn't have the posting fee even attached to him. He signs with the Blue Jays. Now, four years for Rodriguez, a little bit concerning. That dollar amount, obviously the Mets got it done. I think it'd be an amazing contract just because the risk isn't too much um, when you think about it still being less than $10 million. The four years with the uncertainty, a little bit concerning, particularly if he wants to be a starting pitcher. But... That AAV is low enough that if he ends up in the bullpen, you sort of trust that he'll be good there. And at that dollar amount, that's fine. Here's the thing, though. He signs with the Blue Jays. Now, the Blue Jays are a team who has a better chance to contend this year. The Mets, you know, might not be as attractive as Toronto is. They also have maybe more of a crowded rotation. So, or at least a better rotation, I'll, I'll say that much. Might not be more crowded, but there's better guys to top it. Maybe he's battling with Alec Manoa for that fifth starter spot. Overall, I do think that's a missed opportunity by the Mets. If they could have signed him, you know, four years, um, you know, thirty-five million to get the deal done, or you know, even if they had to go to forty million, and it was ten million dollars for a relief pitcher, I don't think that's too prohibitive long term. I would have overpaid a little bit and been aggressive to get him because I think the stuff is good enough, and even if he's an opener for you. It's giving you three to four innings. You know, if he can keep that velocity he showed out of the bullpen in the NPB and in the World Baseball Classic, where he's throwing 95 to 96 with a really good slider and a splitter that he picked up in Japan, I feel like he would have been a really good addition for the Mets. And that's one that I, I do think is a missed opportunity. And same thing goes with Jordan Hicks. I, I think Ronaldo Lopez, he ends up with the Braves. Um, it's arguably the best team in the national league. It's hard to compete with that. And he's got a career four, three, two ERA, um, you know, three, two, seven ERA last year was great after he got traded to the angels and even better when he ended up on the guardians due to that waiver wire thing. But I don't necessarily think that Lopez would be a starting pitcher. I don't, I think he'll end up in the bullpen and $10 million for him out of the bullpen for three years. While I think it would have fit really nicely for the Mets. Again, when you consider where he signed, I'm not going to call that one a missed opportunity. Jordan Hicks is, though, because if you can get a 102-mile-per-hour sinker on your team, go out and do it, and that's what the Giants did. Four years, $44 million. If he's a relief pitcher, it's a little bit steep, but that AAV is not killing you at $11 million per, and he wants to be a starter. That's why he probably ended up in San Francisco, because that might have been the team that said, hey, 
We'll give you that full chance to do it. That that one hurts for me a little bit because the Mets never really seemed in on him. I don't know if it's because they knew about his desire to start and they didn't believe in him when it comes to that. There has been some injury stuff with him in the past, but it has been far enough in the rearview mirror. I mean, the last couple of years, he's got over 60 innings out of the bullpen. To get stretched out and be a starter is asking a lot. I don't think Jordan Hicks is going to throw 120 innings this year, but could he have a sort of weird you know, Swiss Army knife roll, pitch 100 innings, and the last 15 of them are out of the bullpen as they gear up for the playoffs in San Francisco, potentially. Or if you had you know, taken that, put it on a Mets, um, you know, put them in a Mets uniform, same situation. I think that would have been a contract that would have been worthwhile. So the two real missed opportunities in my eyes when it comes to the pitching department is Jordan Hicks and Yariel Rodriguez. I, I think those are guys that the Mets you know, should have been a little more engaged on. But if David Stearns believes enough that he can build out a bullpen um, and if he wanted to make sure his starting options were capable of potentially giving you well over 100 innings, I do understand why the Mets passed on these guys to be starting pitchers. But I feel like at some point you just buy the stuff. And uh, if the stuff doesn't translate to the rotation, great. It's going to be an awesome back-end reliever that would have set up Edwin Diaz very nicely. But who knows? Maybe the Mets have more conversation with those guys than we think, and they got more of a guarantee with those other teams that starting would be a legitimate opportunity, and they ran with it. So we'll see. Uh, I will also add, too, since we're, before we kind of close the door on pitching, if the Mets don't add another relief pitcher to this bullpen outside of Jorge Lopez, which was the only full guaranteed MLB deal that split deals with Michael Tonkin and Austin Adams, if they don't add another relief pitcher or two, that's a missed opportunity in my eyes. There's still plenty of guys out there. Go get some MLB relievers that have a track record to give you at least some form of a bridge to Edwin Diaz. All right, that's all in pitching, but there's still the entire offense and defense, the position players to discuss. I'll go through any missed opportunities there in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The NFL playoffs are in full swing, which makes this the perfect time to get on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. It's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there's so many different ways that you can bet. You got same game parlays. You got the Explore tab where you can find some bets. You also have the Parlay Hub where you can find the most popular parlays every single night. We got NBA games going on, and there's always some popular parlays that you could jump on, whether you're betting on a player's points, rebounds, assists, three pointers made um, combined with the team result, or you're just betting on a couple different teams. There's a lot you can find there. And remember, you place a $5 bet, win or lose, you're going to get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. If you want to start playing today, visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. Fanduel, pitch a partner of the NFL. Now, if you are watching on YouTube, you are looking at a signed photo of Keith Hernandez. We are running a giveaway this week, so you can get this signed photo. All you have to do is become a Locked On Mets insider. This is our texting service where you, you can get updates from me anytime something breaks on the Mets, anytime I got a hot take. If you have a question you want to ask me, one-on-one -on -one texting communication. It's been a lot of fun getting to know some of the Locked On Mets insiders a little bit better this offseason, and this is where we're running the giveaway. So if you want to be part of it, Find the link in the episode description or go to subtext.com slash locked on mats. On Friday, I'm going to send out a text with this Keith Hernandez photo. All you got to do is reply. Reply anything, and you'll be entered for a chance to win the Keith Hernandez autographed photo. So uh, excited about that. Now, let's talk position players, okay? Have the Mets missed any opportunities to add a position player that would have changed their fortunes this season? Well, we start with the guys that have been signed. Jung Hoo Lee, six-year, $113 million deal coming over from the KBO. I don't view this as a missed opportunity, okay, because Jung Hoo Lee would have been, you know, a guy that could vie for center field time from Brandon Nimmo. He could be a star. He also could not translate. There, there's a chance that he's not as good as the Giants hope he's going to be. And that's a risk at that dollar amount. I mean, the guy's making, you know, Starling Marte money per year about, you know, average annual value over $18 million and for six years. And if he turns out to be a dud, that contract's an albatross. 
So with the Mets farm system, where you have Jet Williams, Drew Gilbert, um, Luisa Helicuna, even Ryan Clifford, that could be factoring into your outfield mix at some point over the next six years. I'm okay passing on Jung Hu Lee at that dollar amount and getting Harrison Bader as a stopgap is fine for me at 10 and a half mil. We go to the other deals that have been signed. Jimer Candelario, three years, 45 million with the Reds. More exciting team to join. It's a good contract. I think if the Ronnie Mauricio injury happened sooner, maybe the Mets would have been in the mix, but they were fine at third base until Mauricio got hurt. And that happened five days after Candelario signed. So, you give him a pass on that one. Lourdes Gurriel Jr., three years, 42 million. Would be great to add him to your outfield. Guess what? He returned to a team he went to the World Series with. So I don't think you can really second guess that one. Mitch Garver, two years, 24 million. Big injury risk. I think there's other DH options I'd like more than Garver. To Oscar Hernandez, he wasn't going to sign a one-year pillow contract with the Mets the way he did with the Dodgers. It's a chance to go over there, get a ton of RBIs, rack up some big stats potentially buy for a World Series and then hit the market again. The Mets couldn't have competed with that. Then you get to guys that just don't matter. Isaiah Kiner for Leffa, two years, 15 million with the Blue Jays. Utility infielder, you know, a guy that actually, I guess utility player because he did some outfield last year with the Yankees, but IKF wasn't making a difference for the Mets. Hunter Renfro, I kind of like that contract, two years, 13 mil for the uh, Royals, but Renfro's not changing the Mets season. They have plenty of good outfield options between DJ Stewart, uh, Tyrone Taylor, Harrison Bader, along with the incumbents and Nemo and Marte and even Jeff McNeil. They didn't need to give money to, to Renfro on a multi-year deal, uh, nonetheless. Bunch of catchers signed. I don't have to get into that. They weren't going to sign a backup catcher. Um, they have Nervaez and Nito, so they're good. Kevin Kiermeyer signed the same contract that Bader got with the Blue Jays. Sort of a left-handed version of Bader. Probably a better hitter, um, but you know he went back to the team he was with last year. So I don't really have to Missed too many words on that one. Jason Hayward goes back to the Dodgers. Andrew McCutcheon back to the Pirates. Roddy Telez to the Pirates. Telez is just another version of Daniel Vogelback. I think the Mets decide to move on from that type of a player. Uh, Nick Senzel signs with the Nats. Would have loved Senzel. Guy that could have filled in a lot of different places. Has some upside. But, you know, probably wanted to play every day. That's why I signed with Washington. Uh, the Mets got Joey Wendell. You got Garrett Hampson, Paul DeYoung, Louis Guillaume. All signed similar deals. Again, not going to change your season. You got one of those utility infielder guys. So now we get into who's left, right? Cody Bellinger, Matt Chapman. Would it be a missed opportunity if they don't sign out of those guys? No. Matt Chapman, with the way he hit last year, I wouldn't be buying into him on a you know, big contract for multiple, multiple years. I mean, he probably gets at least a five-year deal. I think he gets north of $20 million. I don't know. The market might speak where he doesn't. He might sign for a much better contract than we think, but... I'm not mad at the Mets for not being in on him, particularly with the qualifying offer attached. Same thing with Bellinger. Um, the fit just doesn't make a ton of sense to me. I think there's a lot of teams that are sort of wary of whatever his price tag has been set by Scott Boris, wary of meeting that for a guy that has some inconsistency in his recent track record. We get to the DH options. Jorge Soler, Reese Hoskins, J.D. Martinez, and Justin Turner. I kind of wish there was more Reese Hoskins buzz. Uh, I think he'd be great in that clubhouse and it'd be good to steal a Philly. I just feel like you, you ha at Hoskins Bader, you just have some good clubhouse guys and maybe the vibes are right. And the Mets sort of go on a run um, gives you some Pete Alonso insurance as well at first base. I think Hoskins is actually the best hitter of those four this year. Um, I actually, you know what? I'll scratch that a little bit. JD Martinez might be a, a better hitter. Jorge Soler brings more power, but just, like the what I believe is going to be a consistent bat that's going to drive in, you know, at least 70 to 80 runs, hit you 25 to 30 bombs. I just like the floor of Hoskins, even coming off the torn ACL. Um, also, I think there's a better chance that you might be able to get him on like a hefty one year deal to prove its value, whereas Jorge Soler has been doing that, might want the three year deal. Then again, I would love the Mets to sign Soler too. Um, and then there's Justin Turner who would give you some third base insurance. I think we'll know if it's a missed opportunity based on what these guys sign for. I'm okay if they don't sign a DH. We've been talking about this a lot on the show. But I do think if you look at this lineup and the protection for Pete Alonso is Jeff McNeil, 
I can say it's a missed opportunity that they didn't add a bat that means something. Even having a more offensive type player instead of Joey Wendell at the end of that bench would have been nice. You know, even if it's you know Joe or Shella instead of uh, you know having Joey Wendell, I just I think there could be uh, a missed opportunity there, depending on what they end up doing when it comes to adding bats to that lineup. Now, a couple of just quick news items before we close the show. Baseball America came out with their top 100. We talked about baseball prospectuses top 101 yesterday. Baseball America had uh, Jet Williams at 30, Ronnie Mauricio at 87, and Drew Gilbert at 93. So much lower on Gilbert than baseball prospectus was. Also did not have Luis and Helicuna or Ryan Clifford in that list. They said they were both part of the 15 players that just missed. So they were top 115 prospects. That matters, though, when it comes to um, the draft pick that you could get if a player finishes uh, among the top rookie of the year uh, vote getters, if they're top two. So now the Mets' one sort of hope at it this year would be Drew Gilbert because Mauricio uh, is not going to play enough this season with the injury. And Jet Williams, I just don't think he's going to have a big role in this team. The other guys to talk about, Colin Howe, Christian Scott, and Blade Tidwell also got votes from their writers at Baseball America, but did not even get into the you know players that just missed that top 100 list. Finally, there was a press conference today to officially announce the jersey retirement of Doc Gooden and Daryl Strawberry. Doc Gooden's number 16 will be retired on April 14th. Daryl Strawberry's number 18 will be retired on June 1st. So if you love those guys, Go out, get some tickets to those games. I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun. I was there for the Keith Hernandez jersey retirement. That was an absolute blast. So I do recommend it. If you are in the area and you can go, it is worth it. Absolutely. And speaking of Keith, again, if you want a chance to get that signed photo of him, look at the episode description. Subscribe to be a Locked On Mets Insider. It's a two-week free trial. You come on in. You see what we offer over there, and you can get in on that giveaway. Um, also, if you're listening on the audio side, follow rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, tomorrow's show, I'll have Javi Reyes on. We're going to do a sort of MLB the show trade. Manny Machado and Pete Alonzo. Why it won't happen, but makes a lot of sense. It'll be a fun show. Trust me, Javi's always a great guest to have on or to have a crossover with. It'll be a lot of laughs. So we'll, we'll do that show tomorrow. If you're watching on YouTube, you don't want to miss it. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, trying to get up to 8,000 subs. So appreciate all of you who subscribe. And also, now that you made it to the end of the show, head over to Locked On Sports today, the first ever 24-7 streaming channel covering everything in the world of sports with our local experts from each team and our league-wide experts from each league. You can find Locked On Sports today streaming 24-7 on YouTube.